This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. We have a uh, presence of a quorum and a full committee at that. Um, so I call this meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.04 p.m. Um, <clears throat> our first order of business tonight is to review and approve the minutes of March 26th, um, which I believe was our first virtual meeting. Does anybody have comments, corrections? The one, um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the couple minor things that I spotted. So I'm um, listed as being there twice. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So I probably could be removed from the second one. And then in this under item one, um, the uh, second line, it says recorder, I think it should be recorded. Are there any other comments? No? Okay. Seeing none, um, does anybody want to make a motion? Mr. Denling? I move to approve the minutes of March second 2020 i'm sorry uh strike that i move to approve the minutes of march 26th 2020. i second that is there any further discussion no, seeing none um do a roll call vote beginning um with mr harrington harrington aye Uh, Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. McDonald, aye. Ms. Lord? Aye. Approved uh, uh, unanimously. I should um, actually go back and comment that this meeting is being, is being recorded and live streamed. Thank you, Emerson Media, for your support in this. Um, uh, you can watch on channel 15 on Amherst Media and it will be um, posted afterwards on Amherst Media. Thank you. Um, moving on, um, public comment. Um, we always uh, accept emails at school committee at arps.org. And for the purposes of public comment, we ask that uh, community members email their public comment to us um, at my email address, mcdonaldA at arps.org, by 3 p.m. on the day of our meetings. And if um, any comment that we receive, we will we will share on screen and and or read aloud um, during the public comment period at our meetings. Um, as of today, actually, even as of uh, six o'clock, I had not received any public comment. So um, we will move on to item three on our agenda, which is the superintendent's update. Sure. Uh, I'll be very brief um, because much of my update will be in the um, agenda items that are below. Uh, I'll say briefly that I had the opportunity a week or two ago to connect with the architects working on the Crocker Farm uh, feasibility study that uh, there was a voter petition. I probably had the language wrong. I apologize. Last year uh, that got added to the town budget. Um, Unfortunately, Mr. Harrington and his other, in his day job, <laughs> has taken on a lot of that role uh, as Mr. Shea and I um, have been tied up with the COVID 
piece, um, you know, I did offer to the architects that if they wanted to push the timeline back from the contract, given the situation, that'd be okay. They feel like they're okay plowing forward. Um, and um, that's probably my only non, uh, only update that's not connected to the agenda items as, as the agenda items of budget and distance learning and, and COVID response have uh, taken the uh, lion's share of everybody's time, energy, and focus uh, of late. Um, so I'll be speaking in much more depth later uh, on those topics, but figured there was no good way to uh, introduce this one. So this was uh, the superintendent update. Seems like it made the most sense to, to mention it there. Are there any um, questions or, or comments from the committee? Seeing none, um, we'll move on to our new and continuing business. Um, and the first item here is our dual language lottery presentation with a potential vote. You're muted, Dr. Morris. Sorry about that. Not only <laughs> you, but I had a little message from Google telling me the same thing. Um, <laughs> oh, there's Ms. Richardson, perfect timing. Um, so uh, this was one of the things that we talked about multiple times this winter. And uh, before we got to a vote, um, life changed. And so we wanted to bring it back. In terms of the life change part, and I'll let Ms. Richardson jump in if she'd like, but one of the th notice, things you'll notice is that the, the dates of the timeline, the dates of the lottery got pushed back a bit. We do have kindergarten registration up and running, uh, but we also are cognizant that uh, it's a different process, uh, and many families are dealing with many, many challenges right now. So we thought, uh, since we didn't have our typical process, which is three days of pretty intensive registration work that's in person, uh, pushing things back a couple weeks made sense, um, both from the staff end, but also from the family and community end. Um, otherwise, I think the feedback that you, you know, received of the winner is integrated, but I'll turn it over to Ms. Richardson. Thank you for being here, Ms. Richardson. Um, so if she has anything she'd like to add before we have a uh, discussion. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm not sure that I have a whole lot of updates. Um, as, as Dr. Morris noted, this has been discussed a few times. Um, we did feel like moving the lottery. The original date was May 4th, um, and considering that we opened enrollment so much later and that it's you know a slower process with electronic registration, um, we're going to plan for a June 1st lottery. Um, and then in terms of the opening of the additional seats, um, we th I put a proposal in for July 15th and August 15th for those two additional seats. I believe that that was the conversation at the last school committee meeting was how long do we hold open the seats for that are being held for Spanish speakers beyond the cap? Um, and when do we offer them to English speakers? Um, so I'll run through that. I, it's been talked about a bunch, but it's it was in the past. So I'll just explain that piece because it's a little confusing. Um, so essentially the way it was proposed is that we would hold, there are 40 total seats and we would hold 24 of them for Spanish speakers in the beginning. Um, and then if by the, uh, the long-term cut point would be that there are no more than 20 English speakers that are enrolled in the program. So there's this um, four seat kind of difference there. And of those four seats, um, we would open those little by little if we didn't have the Spanish speakers to fill them. So I think if I'm capturing it correctly, that was the last discussion. And Dr. Morris, if you have anything to add, um, I think that was what what was under discussion. I believe that we had resolved the piece about the school choice um, Spanish speakers as well, and that's included in the document um, draft that you have as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions and clarify where, what our thinking is. Dr. Morris? Just, I wanna just, um, if I could take, that was a great description, Ms. Richardson. I just wanna take a step back, particularly as we have a new member on, um, maybe to summarize, see if I can summarize the, the couple meetings that we had in the winter so that Ms. Lord is, is up to date if that's okay. If you give me 90 seconds, I'll try to do it quick. Mm -hmm. um, which is that uh, last year we had multiple discussions about enrollment policy. And one of the things that we were committed to is learning from this year's experience to see how we could expand it. I think from the district, both staff and committee 
uh, we had a firm commitment that to maintain at least half the program or to strive for half the program to be reserved for um, students with Spanish language background, um, because that's as we thought about why the program was implemented in the first place, that was at the core of the plan. So uh, one of the discussions that we've had this winter is what's the right number and how long do we make folks wait before we open up the lottery if you don't get more than 20, because ideally more than 20 would be great in terms of uh, students with Spanish language background. And and so I, in my opinion, uh, I'm able to say this, I think we had some really good dialogue and pushed, you know, Ms. Richardson and my thinking on this then, and, and uh, things that bandy, we'd bandied around internally. Uh, it was good to hear from elected officials on that topic. And we tried to take what we heard, which wasn't um, trying to build consensus. It wasn't necessarily agreement that everybody had the same opinion, and that's a good thing, um, with a plan that the committee could be comfortable voting so that we could start implementing, because we do have families asking about it, and uh, we are feeling, a, a, I would say, a, some level of urgency to be able to publish this, um, get it out. If you remember, we were supposed to have a school committee meeting the week we closed that Tuesday, and then there was going to be a registration event that Wednesday. Um, so we, we were hoping to vote earlier. It was really good discussion. It got pushed to March, and unfortunately got pushed to the wrong week in March. And so that's where we are right now. So 90 seconds-ish, um, <laughs> but I just want to make sure Ms. Lord had, had the background on that. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Demling. Yeah, so I, I want to thank Ms. Richardson for um, updating this with um, uh, what I think is a pretty good reflection of, of what our discussion was. Um, I mean, so at, at this point, the the policy as described is, is something I'm comfortable going forward with. Um, I, I would like us to continue to, to revisit this next year, though, because there's two parts of this that I think could be improved. Um, what, one is how long we hold open the, the 24 spots for Spanish speakers, uh, and the other is is dealing with school choice. Um, the the question of how long we keep open the 24 slots for Spanish speakers, um, just I mean, from my own personal view, I think it's it's simpler to to just keep those open until that final date. So in in this case, it would be August 15th, as opposed to keeping 24 open until July 15th, and then 22 open until uh, August 15th. I think it's, I think it's more confusing. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge it's, it is a balance, right, between um, keeping that eligibility open for students that might be moving into our district in those four weeks, and we do get families that move in at that time, um, versus uh, having parents wait. And so, so that is a balance. Um, so that's, that's the simple change I, I would prefer. If everybody is wants to do that tonight, that's great. But I don't. I think we've had enough discussion that I don't feel like um, we need to have uh, some huge back and forth on this. Um, you know, the other point I wanted to make was on school choice. Um, I, I would again for simplicity, and so looking at the the list of the groups there on uh, the first page, which is page six of our packet, and we have group two as Spanish speakers, bilingual students zoned to attend Crocker Farm or Wildwood. And then group 2A as Spanish speakers accepted through school choice. M my preference would be just to have, m my preference would be just to have one group, um, just do away with group 2A and call them Spanish speakers, bilingual students, not zoned to Fort River, which essentially would put school choice students who are Spanish speakers on the same lottery position as Spanish speakers attending Crocker Farm and Wildwood. Um, and I, again, not to belabor the point that we've, I think I've made before, but I just think that um, given the, the primacy of wanting to get English language learners into the program at that max cap of 24 that we've decided is academically educationally appropriate, um, I think it would be a good thing. Um, but I understand it's different points of view on the committee. So again, that's not something that I feel like we need to completely um, get into again, but um, those, are, those are my two thoughts on that. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Dr. Morris? 
it's not a direct response to Mr. Demling's comment, but it's a more generalized comment, which is um, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of enrollment for next year, given the current situation. And, and it's one of the things that we're going to have to continue to have conversations. Um, I think the one thing we know is that there'll be enrollment shifts just based on um, the economy, um, the health needs uh, of students and families. Um, and we can't predict that, you know, this summer, not to get ahead of ourselves, but we're talking about MSA, MSBA enrollment. Uh, when superintendents get together, what we know is that it's really hard to predict five months from now, let alone five years from now. And, and, uh, and it may be hard to predict five weeks from now where we are in terms of kindergarten enrollments. Right now, our numbers are lower than typical, but we're also following a different pathway and folks have uh, many more pressing things in some ways than, than uh, they might if, if, if this situation wasn't uh, happening. So we are sort of planning for the unknown. And I think that does add a variable or an element of uncertainty to this uh, process. So I think it's just one of these things that as we go later in the spring, we'll wanna continue to have conversations with the committee. So again, that wasn't a direct response to anything Mr. Demling said, but it is sort of, um, you know, we're all wondering as uh, superintendents, as we fill, make planning for how many classes per grade level and at the secondary level course select, you know, courses, how much transiency will there be uh, in different communities? Uh, and it's really an open question now. And, and, you know, folks are anticipating, we don't know what the Delta will be, whether it'll go up or down, but folks are anticipating a higher level of transiency than normal, uh, given what's happening. Um, in the world right now. Okay, thank you. So seeing no other comments or questions from the committee, um, are we, do we want to vote on this or, because I'm, it's more of a question of like procedural. Do we, um, does this need to be approved, voted on by the committee? Um, so technically, you know, it's one of the gray areas in terms of superintendent school committee. My preference is that it does get voted on um, because I think it, it shows um, a good faith uh, collaboration between elected officials and staff. Um, I think the technical question probably could be argued either way, but I think more importantly, um, we'd like to, to show, you know, that we've worked through a process and we have that. So my preference is that it would be voted on, you okay. know, whatever the version is, I'm not yeah. jumping into that um, <laughs> the decision piece. That's for you all to, to consider, but um, I, I do think uh, a vote would be something that we could then bring back to the community. Uh, and if people have concerns about the policy, I think from an enrollment perspective, that does mostly fall on the, the elected officials daily way. So, does anyone want to make a motion? So, I'll make a motion, um, but please don't make me make all the motions tonight. <laughs> um, so um, I move to approve the Fort River Comanantas dual language enrollment policy for 2020-2021. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Mr. Harrington. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. McDonald, I. Ms. Spitzer. I. Spitzer, I. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, and now we, um, our next uh, item on the agenda is our COVID-19 in school update. From Dr. Morris. I don't have slides tonight. I'm going to go, um, you know, just oral, but I do have a, a short video that I'd like to show uh, in a little bit. Um, it's five minutes long, so it's not that short, but I think it does kind of, especially at the elementary level, um, show some of the dilemma that we have. Um, so in general, um, starting with the, the piece that on Monday, or excuse me, on the day of the week it is, it's crazy. Uh, a couple of days ago, Tuesday, um, the governor um, 
opted to close schools for the rest of the year. I think it's no surprise. We've talked about it here. And um, in my opinion, it was the right decision. Um, the public health information was showing that, that, and I think it wasn't just the public health information, but the public confidence uh, of returning that soon, even if the public health information improved dramatically, uh, would have been its own challenge for families and for staff and for everyone. And I think it's really important you know, that he made that decision now because it helps us start planning for the potential for what summer will look like and the potential for what fall will look like. And uh, the candor that I want to share is that uh, the fall won't look like a normal fall of school. I don't know. I don't have an answer exactly what it will look like, but I am confident that it will not look like a normal fall um, in school. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is our students will, will not have been in school for the better part of five months. Uh, our staff will not have been in school for the better part of five months. And the socialization process that happens when you're in groups, uh, physically in groups with people, uh, for a large group, for our, most of the people in our organization will not have happened. And, and so we need to do some real thinking about that. There's obviously the academic and, and social emotional piece that has to be managed. Additionally, we're going to receive guidance in the next couple of weeks of what that looks like in terms of um, some precautionary measures from a public health perspective. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of myself by predicting what those will be or talking about what they might be when they come out. It'll certainly be a topic that needs to be at the school committee uh, and we'll need to discuss. Uh, but I, I imagine the one thing I'll say is I'll imagine there'll be real clear guidance about uh, students uh, being in large groups, right? And so you think about assemblies, things like that. Uh, I would be shocked if there's not some guidance around that. I think it'll be much more significant than where I'm just starting with the one thing I feel really certain about. Uh, and as we get more guidance, we'll bring it to the committee because I think uh, what I continue to say to folks, not to be a, a downer, is I think there'll be challenges academically, there's going to be challenges operationally, uh, and there'll be challenges fiscally, and we'll get to that a little later on the agenda. So um, as challenging as we are now, I think planning for next year is really important. And, and the way we're working on it is we've kind of, we work in three-week bunches. So we, we talk about what are we doing in three weeks from now, what are we doing six weeks from now, what are we doing nine weeks from now. And that seems to be the right grain size for us to uh, be uh, working on things. So uh, certainly the, the, where we are now is distance learning 2.0 and talking about that and then getting into budget. Um, we're starting to have those conversations about summer. Uh, three weeks from now, we'll be heavily into talking about summer. Um, and probably six weeks from now, we'll be heavily into talking about fall. Um, the, the amount of work that we have, just the sheer quantity of, of transitioning from schooling as we know it to what we're doing now to what we might do in the fall is high enough where we have to chunk things. Uh, otherwise, uh, folks can really feel overwhelmed. Um, so that's sort of the at the meta level. Uh, something that I'm really proud of uh, our staff and, and our partnership with UMass is um, we got word that um, this or yesterday that we've served our 20,000th meal um, since March 17th, which is just it's kind of shocking, even though I get daily updates from our food service director, when you think of 20,000, uh, it's sort of, to me, uh, just a wild number. Uh, so, you know, it's bittersweet because on one hand, I'm really proud of um, what, what the district and what staff members have volunteered and, and our staff members who are drivers, our staff members in food service have been able to do. Uh, on the other hand, it shows the need and the food scarcity in our community that, that folks are, uh, that that's where people are and that's what the needs are. And, and so uh, I, I want to celebrate our staff for stepping up, uh, celebrate UMass for partnering with us. Um, but but I, I think it has to be that celebration has to be tempered a bit with the needs in our community. Um, and, and that's not slowing down. If anything, it's picking up. And so I just I wanted to note that. Um, uh, we had our third uh, round of Chromebook pickups. I believe we're over 400 Chromebooks that have been uh, delivered or uh, handed out to students um, at the elementary level. This is only K to six. It does include Pelham, so, uh, but that's a much smaller percentage of our students uh, than the Amherst Elementary School. Um, we also have handed out hotspots. We had our third round of pickups today on those. Um, so at the elementary level, we're down to, we believe, in the neighborhood of 10 families that we're having trouble connecting with. Uh, to figure out a hotspot drop-off or pickup, um, which from where we started with, we've made tremendous progress uh, on that. And the Family Center has been critical in reaching out and continue to reach out with those families. Um, we are actively working on sixth grade graduations. Um, I think pretty soon you'll see uh, sixth grade 
families and we'll see a survey that goes out to them to try to figure out it's a pretty big rite of passage and to try to get family and student feedback on what makes sense. Um, and our four, I'm including Pelham in this, our four elementary principals are working in collaboration on that and uh, to try to figure out what's the best vehicle given the age of the students and the event for students to be, um, how should they be managing that? Um, and how do they celebrate our sixth graders who very sadly um, will not be coming back to school uh, as sixth graders again at their elementary schools. And I should actually mention that, I meant to say it at the beginning and probably was going too quickly, is the school closure, I meant everything I said, it was the right decision. And like many things right now, it was bittersweet. Um, the amount of sadness in students, the amount of sadness in staff that uh, they won't be able to be together again in the same way. Uh, and I'm not just talking about sixth graders or at the secondary level, 12th graders or eighth graders, is really significant that um, there was relief that the decision was made on Tuesday. And then there really was this sadness. And I heard from a lot of families, a lot of students, frankly, just even in my neighborhood, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, students who were not, you know, even if their first moment because of some social inertia is to say, oh, school's canceled for the rest of the year, in-person school, um, you know, an hour later, they were really, you know, um, quite sad about that. And I'm sad about that. Um, you know, nothing replaces in-person education, both from a social perspective, but also from an academic and, and learning perspective. And I think it, it's worth noting that uh, despite what you might see in a cartoon or something like that, uh, there's real sadness um, for everyone around that the situation is, is such that um, our hallways are really empty and really quiet, and that's not how we want our schools. Um, you know, it's, um, it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is very sad. Um, we made a transition a week and a half ago to distance learning 2.0. We're going to survey families and staff tomorrow about how that's going for them at the elementary level as well as secondary, but it's an Amherst meeting. I'll speak to Amherst. Uh, we're also going to include a question for families about just what other stressors uh, and staff, but it's differently worded, what other stressors are going on in their lives because we want to uh, we want to know how it's going, but not just on an academic level and how the school's doing, but how are families experiencing this and what are other ways we can be supportive uh, of families as this is happening, um, this phenomenon right now. And so we're literally looking back to, forward to seeing the feedback and figuring out how we can improve what, both what we're delivering to students uh, and families in this unusual environment, as well as uh, what other needs emer exist and how can we help uh, families um, manage those. I think it's a particular challenge at the elementary level. One of the things that I hear um, is you know when you have very young kids kind of the online learning piece is is significantly harder because they're not at an age developmentally where they can work independently for long stretches whether it's online or whether it's even just activities that are sent um, or lessons by teachers uh, just the capacity of, of six or seven year olds um, is really different than when you're talking about 16 year olds at a high school level and um, it's, it's put a significant strain on many, many families. And I wanna both acknowledge that. Um, it's going on across the country. There's tons of literature, New York Times, many article and other, other newspapers are writing about it and it's really hard. And if the chair will be gracious enough, there's, there's a video that I thought um, someone at the MIT teaching lab put together that I think highlights both the challenges we have as well as you know, perhaps how we should be thinking about this moving forward. So let me see if I can once again, uh, get my screen going. And so how to approach remote learning and think about those states that we can form consortium with or borrow materials from or those. Can people hear that just so I can before I play for five minutes, so make sure it's not silent for five minutes. This, I'm sorry. I, yeah, OK, now I see it. Thanks. All right. Those kinds of things. Um, I think another thing that is evoked by this sort of divergence um, is uh, what is the purpose of schooling during a pandemic? Um, what is it that we're trying to...
to make something happen, I think it's good to pause in that work and say, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What is the purpose of schooling in a pandemic? And from our answers to that question, can we help gain alignment on what it is that we're trying to accomplish? Um, when I, on March 13th, I did an, we have a podcast that's called Teach Lab, and I did an interview with a great New York City teacher named Michael Pershand. And, and I said to Michael, who was one of the earliest teachers in the United States to pivot to, to distance learning, I said, Michael, I think you should really focus, you're not going to be able to do everything that you did before, so focus on the most important material. And he said, Justin, I think that's half right. Um, I think I should focus on things that are important, but I also have to figure out what is achievable at a distance. I think there are some things that we do in the mathematics curriculum that are really well aligned that I can imagine myself doing at a distance. And there are other things that seem much harder to do if I'm not right there with a whiteboard shoulder to shoulder with my students. Um, obviously, you know, so that makes me think of this kind of two by two, um, what's important and what's achievable. Um, obviously, things that are high importance, high achievable, those are desirable things that we really want to work on. Um, and in the middle, we have all these trade-offs where we've got to think about um, there may be some things that are really important to us, but are just hard to do uh, at a distance. Um, and we also want to be careful of potentially of things that are maybe easiest to do at a difference, but not the things that are most closely aligned um, with our values. Uh, I think I'll pass on this too, so I can turn it over. Let me just say uh, a few final thoughts and then uh, turn it over to Marty. Um, we have some uh, some guidance and some recommendations in the paper. Here's a slightly different twist on those things. Um, one is, I think there's a ton of great work happening in the United States, happening around the world, um, and I hope folks will borrow liberally uh, from those good ideas, particularly sort of concrete examples of the most common thorniest problems and clever solutions to those problems. Um, I hope that everyone tackling this challenge recognizes the constraints and challenges of home-based schooling, um, particularly this challenge of having K-12 teachers training parents to run homeschools during a pandemic. I mean, the more I sort of say that idea out loud to myself, it just strikes me as a really substantial challenge. It's certainly one that I think educators all across the United States across the world are gonna step up and meet, but I think if we're realistic about what that challenge looks like, um, that'll help us meet it appropriately. Um, my penultimate story uh, will be that uh, when I was in college, I used to run a search and rescue group uh, in the state of Virginia called the Blue Ridge Mountain Rescue Group. And so uh, kids and, and elderly people with dementia would get lost in the woods and I would organize these teams to go find them. Um, and I learned about this system called the Incident Command System, which was developed in the American West to fight forest fires. Um, and one theme of the Incident Command System is that uh, when things become difficult, when emergencies arise, one of the first things to do is to assign a couple of people to think about and plan for the future. So in moments that feel like an all hands on deck kind of moment, it can often be good to design them as most hands on deck. So when we ran searches uh, and did search and rescue work, right when we got on scene, we would take two smart people and we would put them in the church basement and say, don't worry about what's going on right now. Imagine what this is gonna look like in 24 hours. Imagine what this is look, gonna look like in a week. Um, and I think that kind of medium to long-term planning now um, can, uh, it's, it seems like a, like a cost of resources, but I think it can pay dividends in the future. I, one of the things that I think would be helpful right now is to start to get some sort of straw men, sacrificial drafts of what should school look like when we get back? Um, what are a couple of models that are floating out there so that schools and districts and states can start gravitating towards a couple of those models and we can begin planning backwards and saying, okay, we know we want to emphasize this in the fall, so maybe actually we can do a little bit less of that right now or build toward that in a creative way right now. Um, and then I would especially just say to our, to our colleagues um, in state education agencies and So, um, Sorry about that. Um, realized the limitations of my, the bandwidth on my computer and my Wi-Fi. Um, um, think, I'm just going to interrupt. I think we just lost Cielo. Okay. Um, and and Peter. <laughs> Jeez, I'm not going to run another video now. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Peter's back. Uh, I learned my lesson. 
Um, so what I'll say, the, the couple things that I took from the video, and I'm sorry about the technology problems. Um, one was that um, this is a really hard situation and that we have to just be continuously learning and that, you know, again, what's desirable and what's achievable uh, aren't always matching, particularly with the, given the age of elementary age students. Again, it's, it's a little easier. We're talking about middle school and high school students. For those of you who are parents with, with ages, you know, you can imagine what this would look like five, six years ago or 10 years ago whatever it is, and just that the parents have to play a larger role with the, the age of children. And many of those families, the parents, caregivers are working as well as trying to do this. And there, it is a significant strain on everyone involved and we're trying to right size it. And what we're learning, and I think the survey will show is that uh, there are families for which they want more work and, and, and more, more things sent home. And there are families who feel overwhelmed by what we are sending home. And so we're trying to build in choice and options into that, but I, I just want to stress that uh, I'm aware of the strain this is causing on everyone. Uh, I also want to emphasize as well that our, many of our staff members and teachers are also parents with their own kids at home. And so they're trying to do this like everybody else with their own children at home. We had someone who is, is doing more asynchronous stuff because of um, her family situation. She said, yeah, I tape all my lessons between nine, nine o'clock and midnight, nine o'clock at night and midnight, because the rest of the day I'm managing my own stuff, right? And so there really is significant challenges in this context. And to the last point, we are starting to think about summer and fall. We don't have enough people for a church basement to send people to a church basement. Um, that's not in the cards for us, but we actively are working on drafts of what that will look like. And uh, we'll, we'll be working on that a little more. We're going to, I think the state guide, some state guidance will come out in the next week or two, but we're already thinking of multiple scenarios um, so that we can make the best choices of spring by thinking about what things may look like in the summer and fall. Um, I just have a couple more things and we could certainly open up for conversation. Um, one of the things that we are uh, actively working on and thinking about uh, very definitively is summer. Um, I think it's likely that uh, at least some of our summer programs will be done virtually. Um, I don't think we'll have everybody, you know, if you've ever been to Crocker Farm in the summer, it's a pretty full place because that's where the elementary programs are, both the special ed, Title I, ELL. Um, so we are trying to look at that. And one of the things that we're doing actively is uh, the federal government allowed us to Usually you can only take 50, if you don't spend all the money that you receive in an entitlement grant, it, uh, you can only move 15% off to the next school year and they relax that rule. So anything that we don't spend this year, we can spend starting in the fiscal year that starts July 1st. Uh, so we're being very conservative what we're spending, particularly from a Title I perspective. Uh, Title I are funds that uh, go to students who may be struggling in reading or math and it has to be given to students who receive um, they're income eligible for supported to have um, for reduced lunch. And so we're, we're actively thinking if we have to be online of ways to have really small groups online and kind of a tutoring model that can be much more kind of beneficial than a large group 20 student class model at an elementary level, because we know some students are having differential experiences now based on a whole range of contextual factors. Um, so that's one example of trying to think think about our current context and what we can do with resources that we can stockpile um, and use in the summer so that when fall starts, we're, we're, when we think about equity and we think about social justice, we're responding to that in really um, defined and, and creative ways. Um, we're also thinking, because we have a grant for the dual language program about Caminantes, um, there's no way to simulate having three hours of Spanish or three hours of English every day uh, for many families. Some families are able to do that and simulate that, but for most of our students, they're hearing either Spanish or English um, the vast majority of their day right now. And they're kindergartners, so we don't want them online all day long, but we are thinking of a similar model where we can break, um, if we have to be virtual this summer, uh, how do we provide uh, resources for students? We're actually working with UMass right now. There are some students who are gonna volunteer this spring, that didn't happen, uh, but even providing students with more oral language uh, development, um, even this spring, because they're volunteers, so it's not a financial impact. So we are trying to think about who gets impacted, who gets impacted the most. Uh, if we are able to have some students attend live summer school, we're gonna start with students with intensive needs from the special ed perspective, uh, then move on to students, um, special ed students who aren't in the intensive needs program. And if things are really better, then we can open up for Title I and ELL. But we're trying to think of students, again, whose needs are most difficult, most difficult to serve in a virtual environment and prioritizing their needs first um, as we, as we you know, potentially look at what that looks like. Um, the planning for fall will take a lot of time. Again, that's probably three weeks away from being started in earnest. So we do have some people thinking about that, as the presenter from MIT said. 
but I, we, we sort of have to wait for a little guidance. There are some helpful tools. There's a um, helpful website that's got started by some former educators and physicians in the New York City area thinking ahead about um, a checklist. So I shared that with Rupert um, from the facilities office as well as Jill Consolino, our nurse manager today. So we're still trying to work through um, the operational side, the academic side, uh, but the public confidence side is going to be huge. Even if all those things are played out, having everything published, having uh, real clarity, having people be able to ask questions is gonna be really critical uh, for people to feel comfortable and confident coming back in whatever way that we are able to come back in the fall. Uh, it has to be really public, um, and people are going to have a tremendous number of questions, rightfully so, and we need to be able to respond to them. And they're already starting to come in uh, in terms of questions about the fall, and, and for right now, everyone's been incredibly patient and understanding in the community that um, we're, you know, our foot is heavily in this year, and we are starting to think about it, but we do need to wait for expert guidance from the state. Uh, last thing I want to say, and then I will stop talking, I apologize, this is long-winded, uh, was that tomorrow we are having, a, ooh, two more things, excuse me. Tomorrow we're having a session. We have a counselor from the elementary, middle school, and second and high school level, uh, and I'm just going to be the facilitator, but they're each going to share common kind of mental health or emotional well-being challenges that our, our students are typically, or many students are facing offer uh, tips for families. We've had a number of families email saying, can I watch this with my middle schooler and watch this with, can I watch it with my high schooler? And we said, absolutely. Uh, we're gonna live stream that onto YouTube. So it's really accessible and we'll record it as well. Uh, that will also have a 15 to 20 minute question and answer period at the end. So families can uh, ask some common questions that their um, challenges they're experiencing, get some feedback from a group of mental health experts in our district. So we appreciate their time for that. And hopefully people tune in for that I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we're also going to have a town hall next week for staff, um, a, town, a staff town hall, uh, to talk both about you know where we are with the closure, but also some of the budgetary pieces that this group will talk about a little later on the agenda, because we want to make sure our staff stay in, as informed as possible, and uh, that seems to be the best way to do it in, in the current physical distancing, distancing environment. So Mr. Slaughter and I will be the primary kind of facilitators of that meeting. So that was, a, that was a mouthful. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, and I'm open for any questions, comments that anyone might have. Ms. Spitzer. Well, first off, I just wanna say thank you for everything you're doing. And I know there are probably hundreds or at least dozens of people behind you. So thank you so much for everything everybody's doing. Um, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I'm thinking about as we talk about the planning for the year ahead and how complex it's going to be is to what extent we're looking kind of outside of the folks who are employed by the school system to for some guidance in terms of, in the collaboration that's going to need to happen um, between not only officials at the town level but the you know like our public health officials but also regionally and and so it may be too early to comment on this but I'd appreciate any um, thoughts you have on how to draw in potentially members of the public because I think that's one way that we build public trust is potentially bringing them people from the public to the table but also um, you know experts who we have within our community. Yeah so I think it's a couple things uh, so I agree with everything you said and thank you for your kind words at the beginning and it truly is a, a full team effort. Um, I think um, our superintendent's group of Hampshire and Franklin County typically gets together um, once a month at most. Uh, we're getting together weekly because we are trying to look at a regional approach because it, it does, well, we have autonomy of our district. Um, it'd be really strange, for instance, if Shootsbury and Leverett had a wildly different plan than we had, given that we're gonna share students. And you know, frankly, with school choice and the number of amount of transiency we have, um, we don't have to have exactly the same plan, but it does make sense for uh, to have a regional approach to this. And so there's been a lot of, more collaboration than I've ever experienced uh, from our superintendents in Hampshire and Franklin County. And you're absolutely right from the public health official in terms of Amherst and, and Julie Fetterman has been kind of looped into to all of this. And I think there has to be opportunities when we come back, uh, before we come back, excuse me, for the community to weigh in. And I think this body is gonna have a large role in facilitating a lot of that as well as I will as well, because I think they're, my hunch is that there will be decisions that are mine to make, and my hunch is there will be decisions that are the committees to make uh, as we move forward. That it, it's um, 
the, the decisions are going to be large enough and impactful enough operationally where not that the committee just needs to be informed, but but the committee may, you know, want to weigh in more formally on some of the potential decisions that need to be made. Um, you know, and I'm not I'm trying to be a little coy, but if anyone wants the more, you could look at the guidance that the state of Washington has given to its schools for fall. Uh, there are some states that are a little ahead of us. Um, you look at the state of Colorado, uh, the types of things that governors and commissioners of education are suggesting would, would be a very different educational and school experience than what families are used to. Um, I'm intentionally not getting ahead of the guidance we're supposed to receive from Massachusetts because we'll have that next couple of weeks and, and we'll be able to take, take next steps. And I don't want to have the public conversation before, you know, at least Massachusetts folks have weighed in. Um, but we're going to need to meet a lot about that, you know, this body, and we'll need to have some forums and, and gather some expertise uh, from local folks as well. I fully agree. Mr. Demley? Um, so thank you very much for a very comprehensive presentation. You answered most of my questions. Um, I, I, so the thing that keeps, um, I, I keep coming back to with, with trying to get my head around potentially planning for the fall is that, is that the, the resource need, even just talking about financial resources, is going to be so much higher on multiple levels than a normal year. And yet we're going to have significantly less resources than a normal year. I mean, way significantly less resources, um, if any indication from the federal and state levels are, are to be, so it says double whammy, right? Um, and, um, and, and I look at, you know, our teachers in our town, and, and I'm sure that we will do the best job we can possibly locally, but I, I keep coming back to this idea that if, if there isn't a major movement at the state and federal level, then we are in for a world of hurt in our in our schools and what we're able to provide that I don't think we really have a good sense of yet. So I guess my question to you and, and Doug uh, as, as well is, are you getting a sense yet from your colleagues about, about what needs to happen uh, specifically or generally at the state or federal level for funding? Because, you know, this the state budget is going to happen in a whirlwind and we're going to have this small window to advocate for public school funding, right? Um, and if we don't have a really specific... Uh, goal in mind. It's just, it's just going to get swept away with, with, with everything else. Um, and um, I, I, I just think I just think the sooner that we focus on some guidance on that, the potentially more effective we can be in, in minimizing the, the inevitable le level of pain for the fall. Yeah, so I'm happy to jump in on that. And Doug, you're welcome to jump in as well. This came up at, at the uh, BCG this morning. Um, so um, it's hard to talk about this non-politically. Um, so, uh, you know, because uh, I'm not an elected official, but I'm going to do my best. So the first couple stimulus packages have not included significant resources uh, relative to in the whole of those. Um, uh, the stimulus packages for uh, state and state government and municipal government, much of the consternation of many governors. The governors have organized, the head of the Governor Association, I think, is from Maryland, who's a Republican. Um, and they're requesting the federal government um, provide funds so that uh, they can support municipal governments in, in better ways. Because unlike the state government, the federal government doesn't have to balance its budget. As you know, they don't balance their budget. Um, state budgets don't have that option. Um, the president seemed in a tweet, which I'm not going to make a political comment about, seemed to indicate that states and you know local governments might be next. There's been advocacy for that. The uh, Senate president or the the Senate Majority Leader, I should say, uh, made a comment yesterday that um, he was not interested in supporting or bailing out states uh, or municipalities, and he encouraged them that bankruptcy would be a better route than the federal government supporting them. So uh, I do think there's a lot of organization that's bipartisan of governor. I know is bipartisan, it's formally bipartisan of governors to request the federal government to support them as uh, right now the support has all gone to specific items that hasn't gone to the operational deficits that the states are facing. So the federal support that's gone to the states has gone to things like uh, hospitals, you know, like really important things. There's not a judgment statement. Um, so the real question in my opinion is whether the federal government will opt to um, support states to deal with the billions of dollars of deficit that they're going to be running next year. I mean, our state is estimated between three and five billion dollars 
Um, other states are in worse shape because they don't have rainy day funds um, to the extent that Massachusetts does. So my personal opinion in terms of advocacy, um, and I, I think the MTA, the Massachusetts Teachers Association has been on this as well. Um, that's where I would direct it. Um, I think given the state budget and their situation, their the advocacy could certainly help perhaps, but, but I do think um, the real help hopefully will come from the federal government in my personal opinion. So sorry, that was a long answer, but that's the situation. I don't know if you have more to add, Doug. I just a little bit. I think that I would I fully agree with you. I think the federal government is absolutely where the resources exist to to support schools and, and states for that matter. And and you know one thing to keep in mind is while the rainy day fund for Massachusetts is in pretty good shape, uh, there's no way they're going to spend all of it down. I mean part of that exists for this circumstance, and part of it exists to enhance uh, uh, the financial circumstance for bond ratings and borrowing that the state's going to need to do. So they're not going to spend their they're not going to spend the entirety of the rainy day fund this coming fiscal year. So I think that, you know, there is a significant need, even in Massachusetts, who's in pretty good financial shape to have support from the federal government. So um, I think we'll do our, our local advocacy to our, our state reps to, to, you know, make our state budget as whole as possible and as sane and functional as possible and give us the latitude and flexibility to do the things we need to do. But really, I think the primary, uh, leverage needs to be on the on the federal government as well. Sorry, there's one more thing I wanted to add is that we've had some good dialogue with our state representatives, um, well, for Amherst, I'll say state representative and then uh, state senator and uh, Dr. Brady and I are gonna get on a conference call with more state senators on Tuesday around some of how DESE's managing the special ed, um, how they're, the funding uh, for circuit breaker and some other special ed related items that we feel like at a local level um, there's real need for. So I can certainly update the committee. Yeah, we'll be together on Tuesday night. I can update the committee more fully then about where the, what we hear from the um, state senators uh, and if there's places for advocacy after that conversation occurs. But relative to the federal government, it's, this is smaller scale kinds of things, um, but it's still important. So we're still gonna advocate and thank you to Senator Comerford and Representative Dom for for uh, setting that up and, and advocating on our behalf. And yes, Peter, to your point, it is gonna be a big mismatch between needs and, and ability to meet them, you know, um, moving forward. And we're even looking this spring if we do have any financial flexibility, which we'll hear about a little later in the third quarter budget update, trying to think forward about what do we need and, and are there things that we know we're gonna need that we can, um, purchase ahead of time if possible, you know, so Rupert's involved in that conversation as well as Doug and, um, and Jill and, and others. Um, you know, it's hard to forecast completely, but there are some things that we can make some reasonable assumptions and, and see if we can take care of some things this spring. Any other comments or questions from the committee? No, Ms. Spitzer. So just one more question. Last year when our uh, Wildwood was closed for a very long time, we came back and the building was not in, in wonderful condition. Um, but it was a different situation that the building was closed for. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just, it would be nice to get some update on how we're making sure to, if, if if it's possible, maybe it's not possible right now, in which I think we have a totally good excuse for <laughs> folks yeah. not going into buildings, but just an update on the facilities would be great. Yeah, so so you no, know, it's definitely in our minds. And, and a big difference between that situation and this situation is this situation, every workday, we do have custodial staff, not as many, but we have custodial staff on site. Um, so we're able to see when it, when it was the Wildwood piece and because of the asbestos remediation, um, no one could actually be in the school for a long period of time. That's not our situation right now. Um, so I think you're right that it's a, it's a concern that we have and we learned our experience and, but, you know, I know that our pest management company has been in, we've allowed them in, in certain uh, ways. Cause I last, one of the last times I was in the office, they were there and looking to get into the kitchen of the middle school. Um, so I think it, it's a slightly better situation that we are able to have, uh, custodial maintenance staff actively working and, uh, looking to see if there are problems where at Wildwood, there was a very long stretch where they were not allowed in the building. So if problems were emerging, they weren't, they weren't visible to any of our staff. And I think the, the, the last thing I'll say for closing up, this topic is just 
uh, I think the thing I want to share with the community uh, and can't emphasize enough about the fall is while we don't know what it'll look like, uh, it, you know, I can't imagine a scenario where we come back and, and it's business as usual, you know, both again, educationally, um, operationally. Um, and I think the thing that, that I want to stress is that we'll, communi we'll continue to communicate frequently uh, about what's happening. And uh, I know there's a lot of stress about uh, at the elementary level as well as beyond, but I'll say to elementary, is my child going to be ready for second grade? Um, and, and I think what I'd like to say is that all the students are in the same boat. Everyone, every first grader in the district is missing, you know, uh, being in class, missing that in-person experience. Uh, and we're going to adjust the curriculum to make sure that the kids' needs are met. And that's going to be true. Uh, moving forward across the country. So a lot of our work, once we sort of get out of this beginning of this implementation of Distance Learning 2.0 is actively thinking about what does the fall look like? Because it's not going to look like we open up everyday math book and we start chapter one on the second day of school or third day of school of second grade. It's going to look really different. And, and how are we going to actively assess where students are um, both social emotionally and, as well as academically is going to be a large part of that first month of school. So um, you know, it's, there's been some sort of cliched social media posts about this and, you know, like anything else, you see it too much and starts to lose meaning. But I do think it really matters uh, for us to communicate. We'll try to put this in the newsletter tomorrow a bit that uh, we don't want families being anxious about it. Uh, we don't want students being anxious about it. And they're not going to return to a grade level above in the same way that they typically would have, because we want to acknowledge that they haven't been, they won't have been in school for a long period of time, and we're going to make that work for them. Um, so at the elementary level, that's more of a message for families directly. But I do think it's really important to know that we are not planning business as usual uh, on the educational or social emotional front. We'll know that a reentry and a rebuilding of community is going to be critical, and that from a curricular need, we are going to have to think differently about how next year, uh, how next year functions for all students. Um, you know, the best example I tell of families who are anxious is, and some of you may have seen this, there was a really nice letter by, uh, I think it was someone at WPI, uh, but Harvard, University of Chicago, all these major universities are, are sending letters out to prospective students basically, and their families telling them to relax, that they know this pandemic is having a huge impact on families. They know it's having a differential impact. Not every family is experiencing this the same way. There are more challenges in some families than others based on a whole range of factors. Um, and institutions that are, I think, worth their worth their weight, uh, are going to make that work and understand that things are going to have to look different because of this um, imposition into all of our lives. So, I just I want to end with that message because I think it's really important that families feel that because the longer this goes on, especially with Tuesday's announcement, the level of uh, I think anxiety of on one thing went away, and then anxiety a different anxiety reemerged or was um, maybe magnified uh, about that, um, and we're not holding anyone back. Right, it's not there, there's no no retentions that are going to be uh, delivered at the elementary level, and second grade is going to start differently than it would have uh, had we been in school all spring. And um, so, sorry again, uh, I will be briefer in my comments the rest of the meeting. But you know, I do feel like this is a really critical, important for families and for students, uh, critical topic. So I just want to state that more definitively. Okay, so thank you for that um, detailed update as always. Um, we're gonna move on now to the next item on our agenda, which is the FI 20 third quarter update. You're muted again. <laughs> I will share my screen if it's okay with folks so people can see the update as, Doug, as Dr. Slaughter's walking through it. So I'll, I'll let him share that, and hopefully we can focus. Uh, we won't focus on the text as much. If we can focus just on the sort of chart at the top, I think that'll be the most uh, instructive part uh, to take you through tonight. Um, the first thing I'll say is this may be as good a news as you'll get financially for a while. Um, you know, just uh, and it's not that it, there's still a lot of unknowns in in what I'm going to tell you today, and so but I think that the the short story is, is that, uh, you know, with not being in school, there are a number of areas that we're not spending money on, which, which affords us a little flexibility. Um, and so you'll you kind of see that in some respects in, in, this, uh, in this chart of, of sort of where things sit. 
Um, just to take you through, one thing I did for, in some ways, for simplicity's sake, is in the salary line, the very top line there, the budget adjustments, I put all of the um, uh, adjustments or changes that we, we have into that budget adjustments uh, column, and so as not to have it split between adjustments and available budget. Um, you know, we've projected out with the uh, encumbrances there in that column what we think we're going to spend through the rest of the year um, for salaries. You know, we're fairly fixed in what we're paying for at this point uh, relative to our staff. And so it looks as though we'll be in a circumstance where there's about $145,000 of, of uh, available funds that were expected to be spent but didn't. And part of that, the biggest one is there was a position in Fort River that wasn't filled. Uh, there are positions that that were delayed in being filled and or were hired at a, at a rate lower than we expected. And so that's where that number comes from. And that helps, uh, you know, as far as other expenses that are above what we expected. And as we spoke in quarter two, one of the big areas in which we had a higher uh, level of expenditure and knew that we would through the rest of the year was in our, our district-wide special education. We have a couple of placements uh, that were unanticipated. Um, and they have, as you can see in the rightmost column under available budget of you know, negative 287, almost $288,000 that we're expecting there. The one thing I will say around a lot of those encumbrance column numbers, in other words, those are expected expenses we will have through the rest of the, of the year is what that's holding, is there's a number of those where we don't know whether that'll really be the number or not. So some of that is by virtue of uh, we're still negotiating, quite frankly, with, with a number of vendors about what is an appropriate uh, support level. Um, and that's part of what, what Dr. Morris was talking about relative to his, his uh, conversation he and, and uh, uh, Dr. Brady are gonna have with the state relative to how you know, some of the accounting is gonna get done. Uh, there are some, some questions about, um, you know, for example, one is uh, bus transportation, large bus transportation. Uh, I've been working with the other districts that have the same vendors we have, uh, trying to, you know, uh, accumulate information that we're all working from common uh, ground on that and, and understanding that there are aspects of supporting those businesses to keep them viable uh, that's necessary. So we're not going to spend zero on transportation through the end of the year, but we will spend something. Um, and we're trying to get to numbers that, that make sense for us and, and uh, while at the same time remaining compliant with state law. because. Uh, one of the concerns around a lot of things that, that districts are paying for across the state is, are you paying for something that you're not receiving, either good or service that you're not receiving? And there are, there are nuances of the language that, that uh, people are using and interpreting how best to strike those balances. Um, because, you know, they're, like bus companies, I mean, we're fortunate that we have, uh, when we did our bid this year, we had, you know, competitive bid process, multiple vendors of bid for the, for the contract. Uh, there are a number of, of, of my colleagues in, in places uh, nearby that had a single vendor. And so if that vendor goes out of business, they don't have buses to run. So those conversations are ongoing around what we're, what we're going to pay, uh, what expenses we'll actually incur versus, you know, uh, what we expected to incur. The nature of some of how those services are delivered by virtue of being remote is very different. So uh, we're still sort of sorting that out. So those encumbrance columns will probably change significantly. Um, most likely they'll go down a little bit, but not, not tremendously. Um, we've made some estimates on what we think we're going to spend uh, relative to retirement incentives and, and that sort of thing. Um, utilities we know we're using less, but we haven't got a firm grasp on that yet because the, the, quite frankly, the bill hasn't come in yet. Uh, so we can look at how our, our you know, utilities vary from nobody being in the building for a month versus being in the building. Um, so we're still sorting through that. Um, but the fortunate thing is it, it, when we spoke at the end of quarter two, we thought that we were probably in a circumstance where we were going to use um, some of our uh, special education stabilization money to, to uh, support uh, our budget. It looks like we may not need to do that. We'll be making decisions and we'll come back to you with those, those decisions and sort out how we're going to uh, take the resources we have and apply them to the different uh, areas of need within the budget. So, um, you know, we had, when the budget was put together a year ago for fiscal 20, there was an expectation of about $50,000 going into special ed stabilization and another 42,000 that was gonna be used uh, for supporting, you know, uh, contingency uh, needs within the district. Um, we may still be able to do it that way. In other words, uh, earlier in the year, we were thinking all 92,000 was gonna be needed to help support the budget. 
you know, there's savings in, I mean, if you look quite frankly at substitutes alone, there's, there's uh, $115,000 of, of substitutes we're not, we're not buying because they're not needing to come in and cover for teachers by, you know. So, so there's some areas that have so freed up and, and helped us out in that regard. Um, I don't think there's anything else. So I think that the key thing is that while this is where we're sitting right now and it looks pretty decent, I think that, um, you know, there, there are many, you know, unknowns still relative to the current fiscal year. We're not under uh, pressure from a revenue side the way we will for fiscal 21. Uh, but on a spending side, we're still sorting out what, what we're going to spend for the rest of the year and what are those things that are coming up that we'll need in anticipation of, of the new year and to finish this year well. I mean, we've done a fair amount of purchasing for, uh, you know, we're buying misters and, and things like that that help us, you know, sanitize the school in a way that's going to be necessary not only this year, but are going to be necessary into the future. So we'll have to, you know, uh, Go through that process of, of understanding those those needs as we move forward uh, and try to utilize some some potential resources from this year to help support that if i could jump in for one second doug um i think the other so i agree with everything that uh, dr slaughter said i think the only thing i'd add uh is we will you know given this third quarter update which is looking more optimistic uh than where we're at the end of second quarter kind of two other things to say is that we're looking as, as dr slaughter about covid related items I think the other thing uh, when we're looking at the town and in, in the financial fiscal shape it's in, you know, being really conservative in general, superintendents of municipal school districts don't like giving back money to the town at the end of the year for a whole host of reasons. Um, and I'm one of them, uh, you know, because there's always more needs than we can meet. Uh, at the same time, I think being good stewards of, of finances, uh, I think it's a little bit of a different conversation because anything that goes, um, if there are funds that we don't uh, quote unquote need, like for instance, because of the substitute piece or because there's some transportation savings, um, just being really conscious that the town is gonna have to support us, uh, support the schools in a time of great fiscal strain next year. And so it's a different conversation this year than perhaps it is in other years. Um, and um, so just something else to keep in mind uh, as we get to the fourth quarter and as some of these lines get tightened up and, and we're able to fulfill some of the needs that existed. Uh, it is something that we're gonna have to think about. Uh, the last thing I'll say is just uh, from a special education perspective, we're, we're constantly thinking about students who um, are struggling to access the material because their accommodations modifications um, are harder to uh, fulfill in a virtual environment. And, and all the guidance we have from federal and state government is be creative and our teachers are doing a wonderful job with that. And yet uh, we're just very conscious of um, some needs that may emerge and we wanna make sure that uh, all of our students are supported. And for if we really mean all, then we're thinking about students who may be having a more challenging time accessing the content in a virtual environment. So uh, just wanna add that to um, Doug's very coherent description, I mean, a very uh, thorough description, excuse me, of third quarter budget. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Mr. Demling, and then Ms. Spitzer. Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, so similar comment to, to previously, which is, so when I think about FY20, I just look at the calendar and the, and the clock's running out, right? So um, it's it's good that there are productive conversations going on between vendors and districts and DESE and state lawmakers about who ought to pay what and to what percent for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, but you know, my concern from a school committee advocacy standpoint is that you know if we if we wait too long to potentially organize together with other organizations and other school districts. If we can't come to an agreement, um, it's not going to be as effective if you know if it's if it's June 23rd as opposed to May 23rd. Um, so I guess just just try and um, come back to us at the next meeting, um, you know, as as uh, definitive as you can with with what you're seeing from your colleagues. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Dr. Morris with your superintendent colleagues and uh, Dr. Slaughter with your um, financial colleagues across the state, because I think. You know, we're, we're only one town, and so if, if we can pick specific things that we feel are going to resonate and be supported across multiple districts, that's probably the best shot we have. If, if, if we don't have the ideal situation in which everybody agrees and comes to a consensus. Yeah, uh, but so if I can, not, you know, it'll, again, it will again be a very small advocacy window. So, um, yeah. so I'll, I would look for an update for, for that for a, at our next meeting. 
Thank yep. You. And so that next meeting is on Tuesday, which is a joint meeting because this topic spans the three districts, and this is one of the topics. So I think you'll get a much more thorough update. And and I think you know I don't want to preview too much, but I think we'll have very specific information to share with you by next Tuesday uh, about where those how those negotiations are going and and where we're, we look to be able to land. Ms. Spitzer. So thank you for this presentation and it's nice to get some positive news for you. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I have just two questions related to um, the two big areas we talked about in the COVID-19 update. So, or not big areas, but two of the things you mentioned we're doing newly are delivering meals and um that seems like it should be showing up somewhere in here but i i don't necessarily see and i'd be curious to understand kind of how we're we're managing is it through um donations from mass or like maybe it is here and i just don't see it and then the other thing was all the tech expenses we've had in terms of purging them what the hot spots and additional chromebooks for kids in the so are those going to be coming out of capital budget um or am i just missing it Doctors. Mr. Slaughter. Dr. Yeah, Slaughter. So I'll speak to, I'll, uh, well, I'll preview a little bit on that last topic, but <laughs> I'll speak to that a little bit more. But but on the on the first one relative to food service, um, because we operate our own food service and it's uh, we try to have it be self-supporting, uh, that's generally not shown here uh, in the sense that it has a revolving fund that sort of carries the, the, the burden there. I will say, though, that uh, because we are in the fortunate circumstance of having last summer run the summer food service program, we were immediately able to start utilizing that exact same program. Um, and so what's fortunate about that is we're able to sort of implement without worry about support. We, we, they've, they've definitely, the, the federal government has definitely opened up uh, some, some latitude to, to uh, deliver meals in more places. Uh, and get supported in that way. So every meal we serve uh, is is uh, reimbursed. So that helps us. We are not collecting any money from anybody, that sort of thing. Uh, there have also been some grants from a variety of sources that have become available for us, and we've we've gotten a couple of those. Um, and so, you know, one of them was for things that, you know, you don't normally think about with food service, but when you go mobile, you have to have either containers or paper bags to put everything in. And so we got a grant for the you know paper bags, and that's helpful. And so, and I think there will be more of those that we'll be, uh, you know, uh, applying for and getting and and reaching out to help support that that food service program as it goes through, uh, really the rest of the summer. But the the federal government's been very uh, clear and and in, in its support, and and it has also uh, modified some of the rules around it to allow us to serve more kids in more places. Um, and that's been very helpful. I think we've we've taken advantage of that. I think you know we're partnering with with uh, the university. Uh, they're providing uh, some of that as well to to help reduce the burden on us for purchasing, preparing, and delivering. Um, so that's really quite helpful for us. Um, on the second topic of the tech, uh, I will see. I, see I can do that. I don't have the uh, the uh, the documentation we'll need at the end of the meeting that will help this, but I'll let. Dr. Morris, speak to that. Yeah, so the Chromebooks, uh, the Chromebooks were Chromebooks that existed in our district. So our grades three to six, um, all the classrooms have Chromebook cards. So it's repurposing those. So there was some purchasing of um, Chromebook cases because, you know, for our middle school, high schools, we have those cases ready to go. Uh, that's not true for the elementary level where the Chromebooks don't typically go home. Um, but the Chromebooks themselves were Chromebooks that we had in the district that were repurposed and and I'm minimizing the amount of work that took from the IS department, so I don't want to make it, this is a financial conversation, so I'll keep it financial, but it was an incredible amount of work. Um, as you'll hear at the end of the meeting, uh, our district PGOs uh, initially reached out to me with what they could do to help, but I'm an individual PGO, and they thought getting the district PGOs, and they raised, they, in almost no time, organized an incredibly successful fundraiser in terms of hotspots, and uh, so we could talk about that towards the end of the meeting, I think. Dr. Sorter, can we talk about that when we talk about gifts? We can. Right. Okay, so we'll do that then. Uh, the last thing, I think the the one piece that is a, a pure negative fiscally is at the preschool level. So our preschool students, just the short story is uh, students with special needs attend for free as is required by state law. Uh, our students who don't have special needs have a 
have a payment and it's different, it's like sliding scale, you know, there's, there's different levels of it. Um, but those students, um, like most other preschools, we're not charging them because we're not providing the, the care that goes along with typical preschool. So that is something that is a, a net loss for the district. Um, it, it's not a huge amount of money when you compare some of the other things that we're talking about here, but it is something that is um, a concern and it's a concern across the state, uh, particularly in districts that have non integrated preschools um, that rely exclusively on um, those funds to run preschools. And um, that's played, you are starting to see places uh, where there's concerns about furloughs and layoffs in the f current fiscal year for their preschool programs. Because um, if, you, if, you, if you're running it almost like a private preschool that's run in a public school uh, and you're not getting any money, that's hard to pull off. We're not, fortunately not in that scenario at all but that is something to keep an eye on about what that loss is over time. Um, and um, that, that, that's the one area that's a pure loss. I think most of the things Google has uh, graciously allowed uh, K to 12 districts that don't pay them any money anyway to have expanded use of all of their products like this one. You know, formerly we couldn't have that many people on a Google Meet, uh, Google Hangout like we're on now. Now it's up to 250 people, which you would have to pay many, many, many lots of money for, uh, and they recently extended it to September 1st. It was supposed to run out, I think, sometime in June, and they, they now extended it. Um, we are looking at other products, more at the secondary level, um, that uh, thinking about what the future of education looks like in the next year or two that we may want to think about. But uh, to date, we've been doing most of it within our operating budget and repurposing things that we've already, um, we've already had. Um, but you know, I think the Chromebook case, I'm looking at Dr. Slaughter, but I think Chromebook cases is probably the one sort of on the expense side, the one thing technologically that we've done, the, the hotspots we spent money on, but again, we'll get to that because later in terms of gifts. We've bought a lot of cases and I have a PO for more cases that I need to get signed the process. So I protect the Chromebook, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's sort of a good money investment type of thing. Any other questions? Can't see everybody for some reason, but um, but I'm not hearing any other questions either. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're safe to move on. Um, thank you, Doug, for that um, for the update. Um, Next on our agenda is the FY21 budget discussion. Um, would you like me to start that? <laughs> sure, so um, I'll start it with a summary and both Ms. Spitzer and Ms. McDonald were at uh, the board, uh, budget coordinating group this morning uh, for the town of Amherst. And um, essentially what we were told, which was no surprise, is the budgets that were passed earlier this spring or even earlier than that, I think in the case of the library, uh, are not gonna be the active budgets moving forward. Uh, we heard uh, an overview of uh, the incredibly challenging situation at the state level, the local level, the deficits that are coming, um, and, and some real challenges. Um, what, um, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the challenges and then I'll, I'll get to the timeline. I have the slide from this morning that talked about a revised timeline. Um, to pass a new revised budget. Um, like many districts, we're struggling with how to do that. We are hard at work on that. Um, you know, the, the sort of the scenario that we're likely, uh, you see many districts under, I right? saw so, uh, Pittsfield was in this um, situation as well, um, is looking at a level funded budget. Uh, that's not a decision the town has made, but we needed to start somewhere. Um, so what level funding means is that you're spending exactly the same amount next year that we in FY21 that you'd be spending in FY20. Uh, for this district, that's a pretty significant uh, reduction in um, services. Uh, it's not a level service budget, again, a level funded budget. And we'll come back at our next, not our next meeting, next meeting is Tuesday, and that'll be um, a couple specific topics. But we'll probably come back the week after that with some more thoughts um, and information on that. Um, but it's it's a it'd be a more significant budget um, reduction than this district's had um, that I can remember. Um, I mean, I can't go back to my memory when I was a teacher in 2003, 2004, and there was an override. I, that that's a little beyond my my recollection. But um, it, it'd be the it'd be the hardest budget we've had in fiscal terms 
in, in a great many years. And so our team is hard at work. Um, Dr. Slaughter knows this, trying to think of multiple scenarios. It's a moving target, but you have to start somewhere and that's the place at which we're starting. Um, so uh, Ms. McDonald, would, uh, is there, or Ms. Spitzer, are there anything other than when we get into process, anything else that were summary things from BCG that you'd like to add? Um, I would just like to add a point of clarification. I don't believe that we actually voted to approve the Amherst Elementary Schools. That's, that's right. We got we got COVIDed out. Uh, we were going to do that right before. Yeah, the regional schools and some of the other budgets were passed. Yeah. No. I think um, if I think the key takeaway from the meeting this morning was um, was the timeline and also the the desire. Um, just by, you know the the flexibility to be able to do a, a, a one month budget at a time um, and and sort of delay uh, both the town budget and therefore the school's budget. Um, it's we don't want to do that because it becomes more and more expensive. And Dr. Morris um, sort of expressed that um, in 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 great terms um, during the meeting this morning. But um, so the plan is to proceed with a one month budget and not sort of be on that and just push out our timing one month in terms of securing the FY21 budget. And I think you have the the, the timeline. Yep. Yeah, I just know before I bring it up, Ms. Spitzer, is there anything that you wanted to add no, this morning? I guess the next time we're gonna be meeting is May 11th. So um, that was the only other thing I'd add. Sure. So today is the 23rd, so there was a BCG meeting that we just talked about. The Finance Committee of the Town Council met as well. Um, they're going to meet. Originally, we were supposed to pass our budget uh, by April 1st, then it turned into May 1st. And uh, as you can see, as I eventually scroll down, it's, it's now going to look to June 1st to be the date that the Amherst School Committee passes its budget. Um, this obviously is up for discussion debate at the Town Council, but that's the general flow of things right now. Uh, the red is regional things, which are still in flux, so I would um, ignore those. Um, and so on this schedule, it has May 20th as school and library submit one month budgets. That's, um, I'm gonna say this differently. Uh, we don't incur, some districts uh, or some organizations incur significant costs right after the beginning of the fiscal year. That's, uh, Dr. Slaughter can correct me, but that's not true for schools. Uh, we don't generally, the the, count, the fiscal year doesn't flip and all of a sudden we incur significant costs from a cash flow basis. Um, our costs tend to go up when students arrive uh, because of service delivery and additional activities, contracts for teachers and things like that. Um, so that's less of a concern from our perspective uh, about like getting through the month of July from a cash flow perspective. Would you agree with that, Dr. Slaughter? We haven't had this conversation. I would. I think there are a couple of expenses that we pay. You know, you tend to think of like software renewal, license renewals and that sort of stuff. There's some things regarding uh, our folks that are Hampshire County retirees. Those are a few things, but not a lot. And I think that, uh, you know, vendors would probably be a little flexible with us if we need a little time on some of that stuff. Um, the other thing I would say is that I think, you know, part of why a one month budget is I think that the, the, the picture at the state level relative to uh, what their budget's gonna look like and what state aid to local communities is gonna look like is part of what's driving the idea of a one month budget because I think there's, it's gonna hit the state as quickly as they do it in the whirlwind in which they do it. I think it's still, in a good year, they don't get the budget done until the 15th of July. So imagine this circumstance. So the, 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 you know, the give and take there at the legislative level, level will be different than it has been in past years, but it will be no, no less complex or, or, dip, or difficult. And if I'm just scrolling down here, so this one month budget, we, again, we wouldn't anticipate to be any different than, if, especially if we're talking about a, a level funded budget, it, it's gonna be sort of what you'd expect it to be in terms of level funding. Um, and then the June 1st date uh, for the schools to, uh, at the latest date to submit the school budgets to the town manager. An important note that I should have mentioned that was talked about this morning was the capital plan. There was um, comments made explicitly um, questioning in general, the town of Amherst likes to get to about 10% uh, spent on capital a year. And uh, there were some pretty explicit statements made um, that that likely wouldn't happen, that there'll be some trade-offs that have to be made between the operating budget and the capital budget, which the town tries its best to ignore, uh, or to avoid, excuse me, not ignore, but avoid. 
Um, and that's likely not possible in this year's budget given all the other constraints. And so in addition to looking at uh, the the relooking at the operating budget uh, for folks who are on the joint capital planning committee that that group's going to have to meet again uh, and revisit where they were where they were in process but also under different assumptions than what they were working on before uh, and that will flip to conversations for for this body and for me and for dr slaughter uh, as well as rupert roy clark about um what are things that we can't let go of from a capital need and what are things that given the current context uh, we'd love to do, and they're not going to happen at least for a year. Um, and I don't know how Ms. McDonald and Ms. Spitzer said, felt, but I felt like it was pretty explicitly stated in the meeting this morning um, that there's going to be after different different conversations about what percent can go to capital uh, versus what is the been the town's goals in the past. So, you know, just timeline for us locally here in the school committee is that I imagine, you know, perhaps the week after next, um, if not that week, then the week after that, uh, we should get together at that point. We'll have met with all staff. We'll get some feedback. Again, our administrative team is, is working on this uh, pretty much constantly. Uh, I get texts and emails all the time uh, with different ideas. Um, and I think the thing to note, uh, again, uh, not to be downer, um, this is going to be a multi-year process. Right. This is, um, you know, the best economists are coming up with, you know, estimates I've seen from 17 to 22 months of economic impact. So this is round one. It's not the it's not going to be the last round of, of budget challenges that the district faces. And we're trying to keep that in mind uh, as we're thinking about uh, what reductions may need to be made or proposed. Um, and, and, you know, while that's not good news, it's also uh, we'd be foolish to think this is just a one time thing. We'll get through this year. And next year everything will be fine and so we're trying to be very intentional about understanding that and thinking both uh, what we need to do in, in a very tight time frame now as well as what are implications for future years where we may uh, also be having a tough time uh, with the funding piece that uh, we really would love to have so again not to be a downer but i, th I think it's important context for the conversation to come i i had one uh question on um so uh, talking so going back to the capital question and um you know the questions about what do we really need to hold on to um as we as we get to that that point um the capital budget that we put in as 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 an amherst district was pre-covid right so i'm wondering are there going to be capital needs that arise with having to go back to school in in sort of this COVID world if we're assuming that we're still physically distancing and and the like I'm thinking you know furniture or adjustments to room layouts what are there going to be impacts and, and will we have that opportunity to sort of relook at that our capital requests yeah um I think that's right uh, yes is the is a short answer I think the the thing that, that I worry about uh, as we think about it is that, uh, particularly at Wildwood and Fort River, um, the quads are, are, the usable spaces in quads are pretty small. Um, so if there is any like um, literal physical distancing that's required, um, it is something that, that we actively are thinking about. However, a capital need is going to be hard to address infrastructure deficiencies. Um, sorry to use that term, but I think that you know, I think Mr. Harrington would agree with me on that term. Um, and um, and so we are actively thinking through what that looks like. Um, we're going to wait again, I think within two weeks, we'll get some at least initial guidance from the state. Um, but I think one of the challenges will be how do we fit that guidance with our current infrastructure and and, and make sense of it. Um, but in terms of like um, the fogger, those pieces, we we we're seeing what we can do out of this year's budget, but that may end up being uh, having more of those or having um, more cleaning uh, facilities maintenance items uh, that's related to disinfecting. Um, that's likely to be an item that wasn't on the original list and we did some purchasing of one already, but we may, we may need more than what we currently purchased to make school work next year. And those types of things, I think uh, where they end up in capital operational, um, that's some conversations we need to have over the next couple of weeks. 
sorry to put you both hats on, Mr. Harrington. I try not to do that, but it's hard not to talk about it when when, when you have certain expertise at, and uh, in your day day gig. Does anyone have uh, questions, comments? Not seeing any. Okay, so um, thank you for that. Um, moving on to our next topic, which is an update on MSBA. Sure. So uh, for MSBA, it's, this will be a brief one. Um, about two or three weeks ago, the MSBA had a conference call with the town manager and myself um, checking in. Um, they're working remotely and they wanted to make sure we wanted to be able to start on May 1st. And our answer was, yes, we still want to start on May 1st. Uh, the, the, the full answer was we want to start on May 1st, but we told you we were going to have our building committee ready to go May 1st. We were told you we we're going to have everything handed in. We would drive to Boston, drop it off. We're going to be the and and so we've tempered our expectations of um, ourselves on that front because neither the town manager nor myself, uh, it's more on the town manager side of this, um, is going to have all of those things done in the current context in the beginning. But since it is such a generous, I think, 270-day window, it's a long window. We feel very confident we can get to summer and we can get building committee. We can have enrollment studies done. Uh, there's some educational planning that we have to do, and, and and we feel very confident that we would like to stay on the timeline we're at. Uh, I think an additional note that is a cause of concern is that the construction industry um, is slowing down, um, and that's because um, some folks are not feeling like it's uh, safe to continue the work that was happening. Uh, there was an email that MSBA sent out to all districts in their pipeline in their program, which doesn't affect us directly right now. Um, but there are districts who are um, in construction who are having significant delays in their projects. And um, the, the note was along the lines of the MSBA can't increase the reimbursement, even if it's going to cost more because of that delay. Um, so it's really hard time for some districts. Um, I have no evidence that this will backlog us. Uh, we're so far away from actual construction, but uh, it is just, it was a cause of concern to receive the email to, to note the fact that districts are seeing significant delays in their projects right now because of COVID and how long that lasts, hopefully for every for all sorts of reasons, not MSBA related, that's a short one. Um, but it is just something to note that uh, districts are, are reporting getting stuck and constru construction companies aren't feeling like they can uh, continue the work in the current atmosphere and, and environment. And so uh, from our perspective, we're moving forward. They um, reached out again and I know um, town manager scheduling a meeting pretty soon. Um, I think Dr. Slaughter's in it. Some of it's just like financial overview and more on the town side about funding a feasibility study and um, that sort of thing. So they're actively communicating. They're working remotely as well, but they're actively communicating with us. And um, I think things are proceeding as planned, perhaps just at a slightly different pace because of uh, the attention that both the town and the schools are paying to the current crisis. Um, but, but again, both the town manager and myself agreed uh, wholeheartedly that we're going to stay on the timeline we set. We're going to start on May 1st. Uh, we'll be able to meet the, the expectations of MSBA. Uh, we may not just be the, the first ones um, to hand everything in months ahead of time. Uh, we may not be able to do that part of it. And we're looking forward to it. In terms of positivity, like that's a really positive thing. We're in the core program and we're actively starting to work on that. And and that's that's a really good thing, given you know even my earlier comment um, about the you know you couldn't predict this uh, issue with Fort River and Wildwood. We we talked a lot about other problems with Fort River and Wildwood. This is a novel one, um, and even just the shared kind of hand washing stations and all that. We you know we'll have to think through operational pieces, but to think that uh, on the horizon, maybe more distant than we'd like, uh, would be improvements to our schools is critically important. Any questions? Mr. Demling. Yeah, just a brief comment. I just want to thank you and uh, the town manager for continuing to push this along. I think you hit the nail on the head there that um, this is going to be a very long slog, painfully financially in many parts. And if the community has a, a major positive project that's real that we're looking at as a success down the line, that could be a really positive experience for everyone involved, very constructive experience. So. Um, you know, I think it's good. I, I look forward to continuing updates on this, you know, at, at the pace that's appropriate during a state of emergency. 
um, I, I think it's good. It's good to keep it in the public consciousness as we um, as we navigate through these difficult times. Thank you. Any other comments? No, not seeing any. Great. Thank you. Um, and our last item in their new and continuing business is our future agenda, agenda planning. Um, as mentioned, we have our joint meeting with the region and Pelham on Tuesday, where we'll be following up on a couple agenda items, um, transportation, um, an update and a discussion about uh, revising our timeline for the superintendent evaluation. Um, and I believe in more sort of budget update, um, uh, budget process update are, are on our agenda for Tuesday. Um, and I don't have my calendar in front of me about what our next meeting. So our, I, I can do that. I think if you give me one second, our next scheduled meeting is until the 19th of May. We're certainly going to have to meet sooner than that, um, just given the budget situation. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we don't have to do that here, but uh, we can try to schedule something uh, probably next, uh, probably not next week, probably the week after uh, where we can get together and, and um, that'll have to be a primary topic of conversation. Yeah, and I think, um, so uh, Ms. Spitzer mentioned earlier that there is a meeting on um, the 11th of May, which I thought that in May, I, it's, I, it may, I I may have misunderstood, but I thought that that was a special town council meeting um, at which the BCG is in, in as anybody is invited to um, attend. Um, but that is that special meeting is specifically when the town manager um, and finance team will be giving um, their update and projections for FY21. Um, so I don't, so I think that's what you were just suggesting, Dr. Morris, is that it's after that meeting that our group, the Amherst School Committee meet again. Um, yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Um, or yeah. were you the week of the fourth? Sorry. I, I could go either way. I'll put it that way. Um, it depends a little bit since you're currently the acting chair of region as well. You could talk to yourself about uh, how we want to structure because we are scheduled to have a region meeting on the uh, on the 12th. So uh, I was wondering if it made sense at least to have some preliminary conversations. I mean, I certainly, uh, during the FY21 budget conversation set, you know, at least one way to think about approaching this um, in terms of level funding. Uh, that's not a final decision, but I think, you know, I also want to respect the autonomy of the school committee, which, you know, you get to hear what the town says and get to pass the budget that is both reasonable for the town and also something that you want to advocate for. So I, I really could go either way. What do, what do committee members think on, on that in terms of meeting? I know um, we're all living in this, in this remote work environment as well as remote environment and so it is it, it can be fatiguing to spend all our time on zoom and google but um <laughs> so I want to be respectful of that do you um what are folks thoughts on meeting the week of the fourth versus the week of the 11th and we don't have to solve it now but if anybody has sort of any sort of burning comments or thoughts on that miss spitzer well i just want to be conscious of the fact that we're going to be trying to pass a budget by June 1st. So if we wait to meet, and if we can't meet, if the meeting's on the 11th and then the 12th is a region meeting, it's not gonna leave us a, as much time as maybe we need to have enough time for discussion before actually having to make a vote. So I think if we wanna leave room to um, deliberate and have some time to Go back to the drawing board and then come back to the meeting it might make sense to meet earlier but i'm similarly also experiencing been on zoom meeting since about 8 a.m this morning so I'm similarly sensitive to what, what you also stated so i don't know i guess the only thought i have is if i know we're doing a little bit more joint meeting so i don't know if there's a way to have sort of a joint meeting on the 12th that might but i don't know what the agenda is looking like for that we don't have the normally we have that nice agenda planning and no criticism here, but I just <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. 
think I think you're absolutely right. I was as you were as I was listening, I, I my thoughts were going in the same direction is that I do think that given the volume of work in front of us from multiple perspectives, um, as well as you know, juggling with the region the region committee as well, that it makes sense to sort of maybe create a new map for um, a, and potential, you know, proposed schedule for meetings that then we can come back and react to so that we can plan this out um, thoughtfully to address all of the things that we have ahead of us. Because um, I think then the other point too, I was um, talking, Dr. Morris and I had a separate, very, very brief conversation about um, budget hearing we you know we we never finalized our or approved we finalized the budget but we didn't approve it um the original one um and so as we go through this we will want to have opportunity to um to engage the community the public on this and and, and have another public hearing so i think you know in planning our meetings we'll want to um keep that in mind as well as you know and have to get all of that done in may um Dr. Morris? Yeah, so um, why don't we see if we can try to find a week uh, date on the week of the fourth. And I think the couple things we could do at that meeting is one, you know, get a sense of what the financial numbers are for a level funded budget, you know, in terms of reduction. I mean, you, you could look at the past or the proposed budget and look at the, the Delta and find that out, right? That's not a, there's no secret there, but also to have some conversations about, are we going to look to use our choice reserves and at what level? And, and I, I think I'll be ready to make a recommendation to the committee on that, at least to get some, some kind of scoping documents that would orient the committee. So if we do come back uh, a week or two later, there, there's that initial conversation about what's the lay of the land? What kind of numbers are we talking about? How would we conceptualize a process to get to those numbers? Because I think when we try to do that and specific budget adds cuts, or in this case cuts, in the same meeting, that's really hard for the committee. Um, it's less hard for staff because we're living it and talking about it all the time, but for the committee, I think that's really hard. And I think to your point about having a public hearing, I think we probably want to have, you know, my sense is probably three meetings in May on the budget, you know, that first one, which is again, scoping and, and, and giving an overview, a second one where we get pretty specific that we have a hearing and a third one for you to deliberate and vote before June 1st. I mean, I, I do think it'd be hard to, to make the level of reductions we're going to make in two meetings in May, it just it doesn't seem realistic. From again, from my standpoint, it's it's fine because uh, that's what that's what we're doing all the time. But I, I really want to respect the committee and and your time and that um, for you to off, be able to offer meaningful feedback and actually see it reflected probably can't happen in two meetings. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Does anybody have any other thoughts on? Um... I mean, I, I think our agenda is pretty full anyway. <laughs> we know what we're going to be talking about, but um, uh, let me go back to... Yeah, if I could comment on that briefly, Ms. McDonald, just I do think we have to get through budget and COVID in May. Yeah. Uh, I do want to get back in June to thinking about some other things that have been sort of stopped, um, but I want to restart some of those uh, once that process is complete. And it's not going to be the same as the flow that we had in, in February and March, but... Um, I do think June might be an opportunity to do status updates more formally and get back to some of the reports. Like, you know, we talked about Comandantes and a full report um, that's now just about a completion phase, uh, phase from Mabe about how that's going. Right? I don't want to forget those. I, I do think if they get presented in the midst of budget, um, they're not going to be given the full due by you all or by the public. But I do want to think about what we don't have to do it now, and I'm not suggesting it. But what topics in June do we want to come back to to make sure that the before the year closes? we've closed that loop. Yeah, and I, I, I think we'll also come back to this a little bit when we, um, on our, at our meeting on Tuesday in the context of the evaluation process. Yeah. Um, one thing we'll wanna think about is, is how far into June and, and do we extend our meetings? Do we wanna extend our meeting time a little bit further because of all the, the work that is, um, you know, to be able to give our focus right now to budget planning um, and and still tackle and not sort of leave hanging some of the other priorities that we had had through this year. So mm -hmm. we can include that also in our May 4th um, meeting. I see a quizzical face, Mr. Demling. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, so I like the, the three part uh, conceptual description that the superintendent had between 
big picture scope and the specifics in public hearing and then deliberation and vote. Um, a, a challenge in communicating this is going to be where is the budget train with the school committee? What stop is it at? Where can I provide input? And then when is it over? So I think um, if, if we can overcome the meeting logistics early enough, which is not a, a small task, but if we can, if we could set that um, as defined as we can and then communicate that, you know, we don't, we normally don't communicate meeting agenda topics more than a week ahead of time. Um, but if we had like in this case, here's the May plan for the budget. Uh, and we, we were able to share and advertise that to the public that, you know, here, here's how we're going about it. This is the big opportunity for the hearing, even though, you know, we're always available at school committee at ARPS. Um, I think that would go a long way um, towards, um, towards, towards public understanding of how the process is working. Because there's going to be the similar thing happening at the town level, right? right. So there's going to be a lot of moving pieces that people are going to want to pay attention to that they don't have a lot of time to pay attention to. So earlier we can sort of articulate what I think is a really good plan that our chair and superintendent just sort of defined, um, the, the better off we'll be. And, and I, you're, you're bringing up another point and um, the, I also sense that um, there isn't as broad awareness because it's so different, our, what we're doing, we're meeting virtually, we're meeting online and it's on TV, it's not, it, it is being recorded, but it, you know, it's not, it's at the town hall every Tuesday evening or once a month on Tuesday evening that there is this um, uncertainty of, you know, whether we're meeting, when we're meeting, how do, how do folks engage? And I think, you know, as we go into these difficult budget conversations that even publicizing the hearing may not be enough. We may, um, you know, it'd be encourage us sort of over the next week and you know to be thinking about other ways that we can be both sharing the information hearing questions and and hearing input beyond what beyond this meeting because i i, I think that it's um I'm not saying it's a barrier i'm not sure that there's the awareness out, of, about sort of how to engage and so i think it's critical that we figure that out over the next couple of weeks so that when we do get to the point that we're having that budget hearing that we're um, reaching as broad and as, as broad a segment of the community as, as as possible is able and aware to to provide that input. So, um, great. Okay. So with that, we'll move on to um, uh, the next point, which is accept gifts. So, if I may. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, in you know, by virtue of working virtually, uh, the ability to get the documentation together for you guys to actually accept gifts tonight did not happen. Unfortunately, there are a couple of things we have. Um, most notably, uh, to our earlier conversation, there's been a tremendous effort by the the PGOs of of uh, all of the schools to uh, to do fundraising around. Uh, the need for distance learning technology, whether it be Wi-Fi hotspots or support for those Wi-Fi hotspots or uh, any of the related items to that. And so they've done a, a fantastic job uh, doing a pretty significant fundraiser. Um, largely those funds will be split basically 50-50 with the Amherst district and the regional district by virtue of sort of how the equipment has gone out to, to kids and their families. Um, and so I think it'll be all right. I'll announce the amount. For Amherst, uh, we're looking at a gift of about $23,000 um, and a similar number for uh, the region will be slightly different because it's not exactly, you know, 46 on the nose kind of thing. So, um, but like I said, I didn't have the opportunity to get the sort of paperwork signed and, and uh, prepared for tonight's meeting. I actually thought it was at 6.30. I almost thought we'd get it done, but I didn't. It was a six o'clock meeting. So, um, but I'll have that for you next time. Uh, at Tuesday's meeting, at the joint meeting, I presume we can can do that. We'll we'll ask the uh, superintendent and and uh, his clerical folks to put that on the agenda, so you'll have that and and be able to accept that gift. And uh, that really is it's a it's a huge uh, benefit to us to get that and to and a benefit to our our uh, our families in the in the community and allow the kids to access and and participate in this situation we're in right now. Yeah, so we'll, we'll wait till they get the official documentation and then, you know, talk about how we can 
uh, offer thanks to our district PGOs for their, not just how successful they were, but their quick action and, and focus on equity, uh, which is so consistent with what um, our district values are. So um, I'll say it now, but I'll say it more fully then, which is thank you to all, uh, both the district PGOs, um, but also to all the people who donated in the community, many of whom are disconnected from the school and just thought it was really important that uh, the children in this community had full access to learning in this environment. Um, so, you know, thank you to everyone, and we'll, 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 we'll talk more next Tuesday about that. Great. Great. So with that, um, Mr. Harrington, do you have a motion? I move to adjourn. A second. Moved by Harrington, seconded by Spitzer. There's no discussion, so um, we'll roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling. Aye. Mr. Harrington. Aye. Ms. Lord. Aye. McDonald, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Aye. Move that, we're adjourned. Oh, five to zero, sorry, we're adjourned. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. All right.